This episode features a presentation by Gillian Hart, recorded and produced at the Howard Zinn Book Fair at San Francisco City College on December 3rd, 2023. Okay, so um, first of all, I want to uh, express my appreciation to Jordan and Christina for inviting me to be here. And uh, as Jordan mentioned, Howard Zinn was actually a very important part of my life when I taught at Boston University in the late 70s and early 80s. And not only was he supportive, very supportive of the anti-apartheid movement, um, but when I was thrown out of Boston University by an evil character by the name of John Silver, Howard was just enormously supportive. Um, and, you know, I was far from the only one. There was a whole string of us, mainly women, because if Silver was allergic to anything, it was stroppy women. Um, and he kind of lists us in his book, uh, You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train. And it, it, it's a great honor to be in Howard's book and, you know, and to be here. So um, the, the title of my talk today is uh, Beyond the Apartheid Analogy, South Africa and Palestine, Israel in a Global Frame. And I first want to start by with a short explanation of where this talk has come from. So for the past several years, uh, as Jordan mentions, I've been working on a book sort of provisionally entitled Warring Tendencies, Populist Liberal Battles in a Global Frame, which brings South Africa, or tries to bring, South Africa, India, and the US into the same global conjunctural and comparative frame. And I'll talk more about what I mean by that. And the big argument is that to understand why it is that we've witnessed resurgent nationalisms, virulent racisms, and populist politics, not only in the three countries, but many other regions of the world, that we actually, and I think this for me is a really crucial part of conjunctural analysis, we have to go back to earlier global conjunctural moments and most immediately, <coughs> excuse me, the late 40s and the late 1960s, 70s. But very importantly, I argue, we also have to go further back to the simultaneously spatial and historical processes of imperialism and the very specific forms of colonialism, including racialized dispossession and forms of labor exploitation, through which South Africa, India, and the US were formed as nation states, uh, f especially from the 19th century. And uh, these deeper historical processes are not just a matter of a better explanation, but really picking up on Marcus's points, that they're absolutely crucial to conjunctural analysis and to the kind of political work that conjunctural analysis can potentially do. And, you know, as Marcus pointed out, Gramsci's conjunctural analysis is really organized around the relationship between deep-seated what he called organic movements and the more immediate or conjunctural movements, which together define the terrain of... Um, intervention. I would argue they also are essential to understanding the contradictions and weak points where interventions might most effectively take place. And more broadly, um, and picking up again on Marcus, to justify practical activity. Um, but at the same time, I think it's really important to recognize that Gramsci's very specific focus and concern was understanding the rise of fascism in Italy. And uh, if we are going to draw on Gramsci in the present moment, we have to, and this is a wonderful phrase that Ayaz 
and Stefan Kipfer use. We have to stretch and translate Gramsci into different um, conjunctures. And I would argue, really importantly, it's not just a matter of translating Gramsci into the present conjuncture, which, of course, that's part of it. But something that really became clear to me as I was working on trying to understand uh, South Africa, India, the US in relation to one another was the need, is the need to go to go beyond the Eurocentric focus of Gramsci's conjunctural analysis. And for Gramsci, the rise of fascism in Italy required an understanding of not just Italy, but European history from the French Revolution to the Bolshevik Revolution and how this in turn laid the, produced the conditions out of which fascism in Italy emerged along with Nazism and so forth. Um, and in part, what Gramsci's argument here was um, an argument against a very influential character by the name of Be Benedetto Croce, whose history of Europe was a sort of Pacific unfolding of liberalism over the 19th century. And Gramsci's insistence that we start with the French Revolution was part of a profound cr critique of Croce and an argument that Croce's history actually helped to enable fascism, that the stakes of how we understand the past are really crucial. So in, in my own work, what I've argued is that in order to understand key dimensions of the present conjuncture in the three countries I'm working in, we actually have to go back not just to the French Revolution, but to the whole age of revolution, including the American Revolution, and very importantly, also the Haitian Revolution. Um, out of and under, and out of which, which is then crucial to understanding how the U.S., India, and South Africa was were formed as nations in specific, but also deeply interconnected ways. And another crucial piece of the argument uh, that's really uh, was almost forced on me was a recognition of the consolidation of fundamentalist religious nationalisms in the interwar conjuncture in the three countries that obviously had longer roots, but it was in the 1920s and 30s that these um, religious fundamentalist nationalisms really took hold and then carried into the present in relation to changing political economic dynamics and processes of class formation. So for, for example, I don't think you can understand Trumpism without understanding white Christian nationalism and the particular way it took hold and has transformed. Likewise, white Christian nationalism in South Africa in the 30s was what gave rise to apartheid. And uh, very importantly, Hindutva in India emerged in the same moment. And you know, Modi is now sort of Hindutva in, in full force. So, but what I want to do now is to turn to reflect, in, and it has to be in a very preliminary and very skeletal way, on a question that has actually been haunting me since October 7th and the horrendous violence that has exploded in Palestine, Israel, which is the question of what would it mean to bring Palestine, Israel into this global con uh, conjunctural frame, especially in relation to South Africa, but also more generally. And what I want to 
do here is to draw on this global conjunctural frame to engage what I see as two related sets of issues and debates that have really risen to the fore in the past couple of months. So most immediately are these increasingly influential claims that any criticism of Israel or of Zionism is necessarily anti-Semitic. And this is an old argument. And I grew up in a household in Johannesburg where both, both my parents were avid Zionists. And as I came to learn more about Palestine and how Israel was formed, I had fierce debates with my parents right up until the day my father died in 1998. But what has been happening, and I can talk more about this if anybody's interested, is that especially since 2005, with the formation of BDS, Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement, that there has been a concerted effort and a highly organized effort to link anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. And the details of that I'm not going to go into, but they're really interesting and important to understand. And it seems to me that this whole thrust of argument is deeply interconnected with the ways in which apartheid in particular and South Africa more generally are featuring in Palestine-Israel struggles. So I see these as, as, as connected claims and, 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 and et cetera. And here I think it's really important to distinguish between the argument that BDS is making and what I'm going to call the apartheid analogy. Now for BDS, uh, and uh, some parts of BDS have actively rejected the apartheid analogy. What BDS is first and foremost concerned with is an understanding of apartheid as a crime under international, a crime against humanity under international law. And again, I can, if anybody's interested, I'll cite the relevant forms of international law that BDS is calling upon. But it's not BDS, but also Amnesty International, for instance, uses this definition of apartheid, which is not specifically linked to South Africa. They're explicitly saying that this is a crime that, that can be and is committed in other parts of the world, especially in Israel. And the other part of that is the apartheid analogy, which is really a more comparative understanding of uh, South Africa and Israel, uh, Israel, Israel, Palestine. And here I think it's important to, for me to distinguish between what I see as very careful efforts to conduct this kind of comparison. And I have in mind here books like um, the the uh, collection by Sean Jacobs and John Susky entitled Apartheid Israel that was published in 2015 and also Andy Klano's book Neoliberal Apartheid which focuses on a comparative analysis of Palestine, Israel and South Africa since 1994. But at the same time in the more general debate that's gone on and has amplified tremendously uh, since uh, in the past couple of months, South Africa apartheid are invoked in what are incredibly, on one hand, incredibly sloppy ways, where people who should know better make extravagant claims that actually are very easy to shoot down and show that they're absolute nonsense. But the other thing that just seems to me really unhelpful is a very common tendency to set up apartheid as a sort of ideal type and then say, then try to measure, uh, and then there's a debate over whether, Israel, whether or not Israel is an apartheid state. And this rep, what this represents is a very narrow, limited understanding of comparison. 
uh, that I don't think gets us anywhere very far and certainly cannot come to terms with the anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic uh, uh, issue. And so really what I want to argue is that in, in some invoc, but not all, but in some invocations of South Africa and apartheid, and apartheid in relation to pa Palestine, Israel, that there are absolutely crucial dimensions that get obscured. And what these dimensions are, first of all, the global interconnections through which both South Africa and Palestine, Israel, have been forged since the 19th century, very directly as creatures of British imperialism. And what also gets ignored and, and obscured are the specific but interconnected histories of settler colonialism and racialized dispossession that seem to me really have to be understood. Um, second is the consolidation of fundamentalist religious nationalisms in the 20th and 21st centuries, not only in South Africa, the US and, is, and, and India, but very importantly also in Israel with the rise of Zionism and also political Islam. So that uh, religious nationalisms in Palestine, Israel are not peculiar by any means. They are part of a much broader set of global processes that have been going on for a long time. Of course they take historically specific forms, but thinking of them not as peculiarities, but as part of broader processes, I think is really important. And, uh, and speak directly to how these dynamics are playing out in the present in relation to global processes. Now, as I warned Jordan, this, I think I'm 15 minutes in. Right? Yeah, that's about right. Okay. So, what I'm going to do in the, in the five minutes I have left is just try very quickly to demonstrate what I mean by why it is that this deeper historical uh, set of understandings matters. I cannot go into what does this all mean in the present in five minutes. But uh, going back to the argument um, about uh, the need to go back to the age of revolution, the global, con and I'm talking particularly now of the global conjunctural moment is uh, immediately following the age of revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, which is precisely the moment of the rise of British imperialism. And it's very much the loss of the US, the way Britain gets kicked out of the US, that leads Britain to take over India and kick out the other imperial powers that were in India. And this is where what they also did was to kick the Dutch out of Southern Africa in order to use the Cape to ensure the passage to India. Now what's also... Um, and and once and once Britain sort of moves in in this direction, then South Africa over the 19th century is where Britain dumps its surplus populations attendant on the rise of industrial capitalism, the the empire of cotton, uh, and it's really only in the latter part of the 19th century that Britain becomes really interested in South Africa with the minerals discoveries. But you know what's really interesting is that it's at this moment when Israel, when 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 Britain takes over Southern Africa, they also get really interested in Palestine, which of course then is part of the Ottoman Empire, which is in the process of decline. And the first Zionists, actually Christian Zionists in Britain, who think it would be a jolly good idea to take over Palestine. So this, there, there's a, a much earlier move of, 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 uh, of, um, of Zionism that precedes the Zionism we know. 
Now, a second key co global conjunctural moment is the age of empire, the period from sort of the mid to late 1870s up until the First World War. And I'm just going to focus here on South, firstly on South Africa. Britain's effort to take over, Britain takes over the Boer republics where the minerals are located in the course of the Anglo-Boer War. Um, and remember, this is also the height of the gold standard. In 1910, South Africa is formed as a nation with the two former Boer republics, the two former uh, set of uh, uh, white colonies of the Cape and Natal. But what is important here is that this is, it, it's w white English and Afrikaans speaking South Africans. Black South Africans are excluded from the settlement that leads to the formation of South Africa. Black labor is, and cheap black labor, is ensured through the 1913 Land Act, which is a massive process of racialized dispossession that confines black South Africans, who are well over 80% of the population, to 6% of the land, which subsequently increased to 13%. Now, it seems to me that there's an incredibly interesting parallel here between what is going on around Zionism, Israel, Palestine. Because the age of empire is exactly the period in which the pogroms that are going on in Eastern Europe lead to large-scale migration of Jews from Eastern Europe to other parts of the world, especially to Britain. And my paternal grandfather was part of that movement, leading to the formation of the Jewish problem. And this is where uh, the, um, the, the Balfour Declaration of 1917, at which Britain basically hands over um, uh, uh, Palestine to the Zionist movement, which itself emerges as a reaction to the vicious anti-Semitism going on um, in different regions of the world. And I think what's really important here is that uh, for a long time, Zionism, within Judaism, Zionism was actually a minority movement. But this, uh, the Balfour Declaration, 1917, I see as, as you know, a moment of nation formation that is different from, but has connections and resonances with uh, the 1910 formation of South Africa. So secondly, Jordan, how much? Out of time. All right, very quickly. So <laughs> the, inter the interwar years, the consolidation of religious nationalism. So I think it's really important to remember here. This is the moment of the Bolshevik revolution, of insurgent movements all over the world, of nationalisms really taking hold, closing borders. Uh, the U.S., you know, passports. This is also when restrictions on Jews into the U.S. are set in place. Um, it's also in the 30s, global economic crisis, the rise of fascism and Nazism. But it really is within this period that religious nationalisms really take hold and consolidate. And um, this is where also anti-Semitism that gathers force through the 1930s and into the, of course, into the war, are what gives Zionism its, its um, moral force. But I think what is so crucial here is that this is a set of conditions that emerge from refusals of other of Euro America to take in Jews. And you know, it seems to me what this underscores is how over a long period of time Palestinians have been called on to pay the price for anti Semitic crimes in Euro America and it's Palestinians who are having to pay this price. 
I can't go into the details of how I think this really helps us disentangle these claims about uh, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. But I think that this kind of much longer history is a crucial element of what's needed in order to challenge these incredibly dangerous claims that are actually gathering force right now. So sorry, I went on too long. You know, Jill, I, I just thought this is so fascinating and important, your uh, discussion about the, you know, spurious ways in which there's a conflation between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. And I've you know, heard you say elsewhere, this is something that we really need to take seriously, that the Biden administration is pushing, and we know there's consequences on our campuses and our streets and all around the world. But you said, you know, uh, I would want to disentangle it a bit. And so I just wonder if you could take a couple of minutes to disentangle, uh, because you said you had more to say, and then we'll open it up. Is that okay? Yeah. Well, I, I think most immediately um, it's important to understand how following 2005 there was a concerted effort to connect anti-Zionism uh, or any critique of Israel with anti-Semitism. And it was, it was, remember BDS came into being in 2005. But what was really crucial was the Gaza War of 2008-2009. And as part of that, I mean, BDS, th that obviously bolstered BDS, the position of BDS. But what also happened, and just let me see if I have my notes on that here. That was also the period in which um, the UN set in place something called the Goldstone Commission. And the, uh, the Goldstone Commission was, uh, I'm gonna have to do it off the top of my head, but it was a UN, it was a UN General Assembly inquiry into the Gaza War. It was led by Richard Goldstone, who was a very senior jurist in South Africa. What Goldstone basically said was that both Israel, Israeli and Palestinian uh, forces had committed war crimes, but that Israel in particular had engaged in terrorist activities to, among civilians to foment, uh, um, and, you know, to foment fear. And what Goldstone also said was it, it was that it was very likely that what Israel had done was a crime against humanity. And that, of course, jived very closely with the BDS argument about apartheid as a, as a, in, as a crime under international law. And that is the point at which um, and I, a, a, a guy by the name of, of Yossi Kupavasa took over a key um, ministry in Israel that was very much directed in his terms to showing that anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism is the same lady in a different cloak. You know, there's kind of gender at work here, right? Uh, and he also made clear that this was uh, that this effort was designed to to absolutely put the lid on uh, BDS. Um, what also happened in 2016, and I'm sorry, I brought the wrong notes, but the, uh, the but something called the international I don't have the exact language, but the International Holocaust Awareness basically. Uh, in uh, uh, sort of consolidated the equation of anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. And 35 countries, mainly in North America and Europe, have signed on to that along with Australia, Argentina, and Israel. Uh, but for instance, I mean, just as an example, there's a lawsuit cu currently being brought against the law, uh, law school students at UC Berkeley 
who refuse to have Zionist speakers, and they're using this international Holocaust awareness thing as part, as a key part of the um, the suit. So you know, this is the more immediate thing. I mean, the argument I'm, I want to make, and I can only do it very broadly here, is sort of recognizing how for Britain, Br British imperial control over Palestine, right from the get-go, was both geopolitical and a way of solving the Jewish problem, in a way that Zionists totally bought into. And so it seems to me that's a kind of a very key moment where anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism relate to one another in a way that is completely at odds with claims that seek to conflate them. So, okay, Joe, uh, we didn't get to the practical reality uh, mm. what we're going to do besides yell at our TVs and sign petitions and so on. But, um, so, okay, if the apartheid analogy is inadequate, can you, I'd really like you to say more about how we should talk about it because it's clearly, you know, apartheid was about labor control. All of these, the US uh, the colonization of North America by the British, all the examples, they're all about labor control. And even we could fit the Pakistan into this in a different way. So, okay, how should we talk about what is valid, what's not valid? get beyond the uh, human rights, uh, universal human rights context, and talk about the real the realities. You know, you know what I'm asking, right? So, uh, Kathy, just really quickly, I think uh, historically one can, I think there are historical arguments which I won't go into. But in the contemporary, uh, you know, the more, the present moment, I think uh, Andy Klano has a really interesting argument, which is what is going on both in South Africa and in Israel-Palestine is a process through which labor is, is actively being sort of extruded from the economy. That Israel is importing yes. cheap Thai yes. and, and other workers for agriculture. Oh. But that what is, you know, that a, a sort of a parallel set of processes are going on through an ongoing and accelerating process of production of, of labor that is surplus to the needs of capital. Thanks to all our viewers and listeners for joining us for Conjuncture. Stay tuned.